today on Attitude. Wild woman Judy Tenuta explains why President Bush paid her $5,000 to keep her out of the White House. The Bradley sisters are reunited. Meet Billy Joe, Bobby Joe, and Betty Joe from TV's Petticoat Junction. In the headlines and the covers of magazines, a woman who says she was date raped speaks out against a man who says women need to take responsibility for themselves. And an Amish secret for great tasting muffins from TV's Amish Cooking from Quilt Country, Marsha Adams. It's all up next. Linda Dano and Jerry Penicoli. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jerry Penicoli. And I'm Linda Dano. Welcome to Attitude. We're going to tackle a real serious issue today, folks. It's been in the newspapers and the cover of Time Magazine, People Magazine, date rape. You've been hearing a lot about it with the Palm Beach case, Willie Kennedy Smith. And we've got a woman here today who says that she's been date raped. And we have a guy who is not a rapist, but he has some real strong opinions about when it is and is not date rape. So we're going to hear from you. That'll get people. some reactions. That's right. It, ladies? Also, we're going we're gonna to get to meet, after all these years, the ladies, the sisters from Petticoat Junction. Isn't from the Shady fun? Rest Hotel. Yeah. yeah. So, and they all look great. They really do. Are they going to be in their petticoats? <laughs> no. Too bad. No, but they Darn. do look great. You're going to enjoy seeing them. It's fun to see people from our past. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We'll wait to see what our uh, first guest is wearing today. Of course, she always looks, looks like this. She's terrific. Our next guest describes herself as part Groucho Marx, Lady Macbeth, and Tinkerbell. Her abusive, outrageous comedy act has audiences everywhere begging for more. Here's a look at her in Lifetime's Love Laughs. Take a look. That's right, I'm Judy! Petite flower and princess of panty shields! <laughs> That's right, you better buckle up, stud puppets! <laughs> because I'm hot! I'm hungry! And I'm husband hunting! for a love pig, baby. Love pig. <laughs> yeah, you've got a chance. Please welcome the petite flower herself, the giver goddess of stand-up, Judy Tenuta. Oh, oh, really? Don't forget your purse. A Come on over. can never be without her love bag. <laughs> All right. Oh, for me? For you, yes. You Ooh. may uh, have as many as you oh, want. Oh, yes. Or put some in your hair, or you've already got some. Yes, in your I hair. do. Oh, look at you, you beefy burrito of man. <laughs> How many hours? You were stuck like, on that plane, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. And there's this toad sitting next to me. You know, he looked like a like a squid in stretch pants, you know, Jerry? Oh, Nate, nice. like you're not ready for this. Right? <laughs> 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 
Yeah, I said, just tell just, him to sit next to you. Just yeah. tell him to sit next to me. He says, Judy, when you come on Attitudes, make sure you mention my name. Say hi to me. Say hi to me, okay? Would you please say hi to me? Yeah, you know, like, I'm going to bring your show to a screeching halt to say, hi, Trump. <laughs> He's a pig. He's a pig. He's a pig. And how about Marla, Miss 1900 Layaway? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can say anything it. you want to. Oh, yeah, sit down, oh, yeah, relax. Oh, do you mind? I have too much stack to trip. <laughs> Wait a minute. Sniff this. <laughs> Where did you come from? Where? When did you? <laughs> Judy, 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 you're When did you start this relationship? You must take a vow now. Raise that right hook. Yes. Raise your hook and repeat after me. I promise. I promise. To be Judy's sex donkey. Is this, <laughs> is this gonna make me a love pig or something? Yes, it's oh, okay. perfect for you. Of course, that's what I've always wanted to be. And also, huh? here, here, put this on. <laughs> put this on. He's been healed through Judaism. <laughs> Have any religious organizations gotten upset about that? No, much later, much later, <laughs> Terminator. What? No. And now, you know what? Though? This is Judaism with this a Y. Is, this is Judaism with a Y, and it's. But wonderful. are you the Blessed Virgin? Not. Oh! <laughs> Close your eyes! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Close your eyes! Okay, it's no. time to put on a top power tie. Linda, come here. <laughs> Wait, I need. I'm afraid Where's to close that? my eyes. Just close your damn eyes! <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna put a real power tie on you. Linda, help no, me. I save think, me. I think, Jerry, I think this is this really is it, right? out of our control. <laughs> close what you your got? eyes! It's all right, all right. Oh. Here, get on the tie. What? Come here. <laughs> what is this? Oh, wait. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing here, to me? You put your arms through it. But this is a real power tie, honey. What is this? Come on! What is it? <laughs> Sorry, Jerry. What are we, I don't what are you know. doing? Are you turning on me? Thank you, Linda. Thank you. This was a Look, setup. This was a oh, setup. Tell him. She's innocent. I am innocent. Yes. Oh, no. Let's go. Jerry, Let's go, go to the audience. Come here. I want to. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. We'll just proceed. Do you want me to Let's, help you out? I like no, I think, that. I think I like I'll be okay. Let's do I, the interview. <laughs> yeah. Dream on, Klingon. All right. Come on. Huh? It's time to go in the audience. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. I want to look. I can get out of here. Wait till you see this. Yay. I can't help myself. So many pseudo versions. Could you help me with this, please? No, but here, here. You got it. Good. Wait till you see what I'm going to do now. See, so many petite flowers such as we have in the audience here yeah. want to know how, what to do for their stud puppet. Now, a stud puppet. Yes, we have to walk our... No, 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 this is all yours, Judy. <laughs> this is all up to you. Hey, is he your boyfriend? <laughs> well, we're in New York. Come on. Come on. Get down. Oh, look at this beard. I like when guys wear their hormones on the outside. Come on. Hey, wait a minute. Now, I bet you you'll do it if, if she walks you, right? How to walk. This is how to walk your stud puppet. Okay, come on. Of course, you mean you mean stud puppet very affectionately, don't yes, you? Yes, I mean it as a compliment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, excuse me, what? I, I like you. Why are you even living? Come on, stand up. Oh, is that your girlfriend? Oh, then that's perfect. Stand up, honey. <laughs>
Is this a slick or what? Yeah, wait. Oh my God, look, there's a tree. What are you going to do? <laughs> All right, you guys, enough abuse. Right? Hey, do you get Judy serious enough for one second? Let's be serious. No, wait, you get... I want to She's not serious. I have a date with Howard Stern. I need this. Okay. <laughs> do, you ever get, do you ever get men who really turn on you and don't like this kind of uh, What do you call abuse? this? <laughs> nice attitude on you, Pokey. But you know he loves the goddess, don't you? You can't wait to put bread in my oven, you hot mule, my man. <laughs> No, but I want to hear the story about how you left the strapless bra as a tip in a restaurant one time. <laughs> tell us that. He's been reading about the love goddess. <laughs> That's oh. right. I did. Well, so you gave away the punchline, pig. Um, <laughs> nice. No, I did. But wait, you want to know a good story? Yeah. This is almost. Oh, like... you got to tell us that story, though. No, well, yeah, I left. Okay, I left the bra as a tip. Are you happy? Yeah, but. Now, wait a minute. But why? Because why? a bunch of lesbians were sitting around and it got them hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were. I did it! It wouldn't take much of a tennis match to make them grease up my truck, you know what I mean? All right. <laughs> oh, so what? Come and get me! Come and get me, Martina! I, I want to sing to you now, Jerry. Come on, Go ahead, sing. I like boys who wear my clothes and live with their mothers and pick their toes. We're not rapping it. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. You can see more of Judy in a Lifetime special. God only knows why we gave her one. It's called Love Laughs, which airs here on Lifetime and on Saturday. My August, my oh, wait, wait a second. August 31st at midnight and Wednesday, September 11th at 11 p.m. And her new book coming out when? In September? September? Yes! It's called the, Judaism. The Power of Judaism. You got it. And I'm hosting Spotlight Cafe on WOR. Anything else you want to tell us before you go? Yeah! Donkey. All right. <laughs> Linda, save me. <laughs> I don't think I can. I don't. I'm a stripping from 12 Country. She needs Chef Marsha Adams with great taste to digital Amish recipes. But first, you go out on an innocent date with a nice guy and expect a great evening, but it turns out to be the most horrifying experience of your life. Next, the truth about date rape. Stay with us. Ahead. Meet the sisters from the Shady Rest Hotel as we take a trip back to Petticoat Junction. Welcome back to Attitudes. Date rape. It's a volatile issue making headlines all across the country. William Kennedy Smith has been in the news constantly since his much publicized rape incident. In New York, there was the controversial case of three St. John's University athletes accused of sexually assaulting a 22-year-old co-ed. Date rape was also a recent People magazine cover story and Time magazine devoted an entire issue to the subject. Now, this topic is especially painful for this young woman, for Delicia Meehan, who was a 22-year-old widow dating for the first time since her husband's death. Now, he acted like a perfect gentleman on their first date. However, after their second date, she says he turned from a Dr. Jekyll to a Mr. Hyde and brutally raped her in her living room as her two-year-old daughter slept upstairs. Her date has since been acquitted of all charges. Also meet Michael Platteroti, uh, sorry, Michael. That's right, huh? Platteroti. He is a 25-year-old bachelor who recently broke up with his girlfriend and says he now dates about twice a week. Michael says that he is not sure that all cases of date rape are actually rape. Please welcome them, will you? All right, Delisa. First of all, tell tell us how this uh, this incident occurred and when it happened. Well, it happened in 1988. We went out. He took me home. He was very nice. I mean, he was perfectly gentleman. You knew this guy? Uh-huh. I knew him. I had dated him once or twice before. Was he a friend of your... Um, he, we were introduced through mutual friends. 
and the, everybody said he was really nice. And then after he left my house that night, he came back in after I was asleep. And when I woke up, I woke up to someone pulling my clothes off. And I told him no. I tried to push him away, but he was bigger than me, and I was scared. I didn't know what he was going to do. I hadn't never seen a side of him. Now, you guys had gone out and had a nice dinner, and you were back in your apartment, mm -hmm. and he had taken the babysitter home, is right. that what it was, and then left your door open, basically, unlocked. It was unlocked. I didn't know. And you had fallen asleep. Had, had either of you been drinking? Yes, I'd had three drinks. He had had numerous ones. Okay, the and then he came back into your house mm -hmm. and just tore your clothes off? I woke up, he was, I was on my couch, and he was pulling my clothes off. I was trying to pull them on as he was pulling them off. It, there wasn't anybody around, so I couldn't yell. I was scared. I just, I went totally still. What was going through your mind when, when this was happening to you? I was in shock. I couldn't believe that it was the same person that I had seen the previous times. He gave no indication that he was going to act that way. Now. Your two-year-old daughter was upstairs mm -hmm. sleeping at the time. Right. How did that affect you? I was scared. I didn't want to do anything that would cause her any harm. I didn't know if I did, the more if I fought him, if he got mad, if anything would happen to her. I mean, she came first. I didn't know what to do. I was twice as scared. Was he brutal with you? He wouldn't stop. He didn't physically beat me up or anything. but. He, there was no way I could stop Were you him. saying, no, please get off? And he, he, he would not listen? No, I was trying to push him off and I couldn't. And he did not have a, a weapon or anything? He was not holding no. you at knife point or no, gun point or anything? not at okay. all. Because that's what we usually think of when we hear of rape, okay? But w we've come to find out that that's not, not always the case. Now, this man was, was tried and he was acquitted. Mm -hmm. What did that make you feel after that happened? I couldn't believe that the judicial system would let me down that way. I found out a victim has a lot less rights, it seems like. Than they didn't the believe you? I didn't get a jury trial. Do you think it was because you had been drinking as well as the fact that he had been drinking? I don't know. The judge would never, never told me why. All right. Michael, you have said to us that, uh, and I quote, when a man is with a woman, there is a point of no return. You told that to one of our producers when, when she was talking to you prior to this interview. What do you mean by that exactly? If you go out on a date with a girl and um, let's say you know each other, or you don't know each other, you're having a great time and uh, you have some drinks, um, you go back to your place, her place, and you start fooling around, you're uh, kissing, hugging, petting, um, she's showing you green light, green light, green light, green light, and all of a sudden she flashes a red. Um, a guy, I don't think a guy is wrong to try to persuade her without physically holding her down or, you know, demanding to persuade her, you know. You're talking about psychologically yeah, persuading her. Yeah, or you can even, even physically, it, it, you know, uh, a situation where he'll put his hand, let's say, you know, in between her legs, and she'll move it. And they'll still continue kissing and You don't hugging. think that means no? No, I don't think, uh, if he tries it again, okay, let me finish the point. If he tries it again, and this time she's not so quick to move it, okay, now in his mind, he's making progress. He's like, oh, she let me keep it there longer this time. So just as she has the right to change her mind, he has the right to try to persuade her, uh, you know, when is no? When is no, no? Well, if she's, I mean, she's, I mean, in Delicia's case is a little different. I mean, this guy, he attacked her. He physically held her down. She, she told me, she said she was yelling, no, 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 constantly. Well, that's, you know, get off. That's, that's ridiculous. But um, in, in the other situation where if you show green light and, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with a guy trying to persuade you. But what about a woman if she changes her mind? Like I said, she, if she has the right to change her mind all of a sudden say no, why not try and say, well, why not, you know? Do I, you think sometimes, though, that that no means yeah? Yeah, why not? I mean, there are times when, you know, you're with, you're with someone and, and uh, um, you know, I know of experiences where um, they're having intercourse and during intercourse they'll say, oh, we shouldn't be doing this. You know, you've heard that before. But you're still doing it. I mean, so, you're, not so what, you're not pushing not pushing me off. So what you're saying is that the first no doesn't necessarily always mean no. We're not raised like that. We're not raised like that. No. When you hear no, 
or any person who's no, they're still going to try one more time to get a yes. What, what do you think about that audience? Do you, do, do you agree with that? No. All right, we're getting an overwhelming no in, in, in that. And we're going to talk to them about this uh, after we take this break. And Delisha, I want to get your response to what Michael is saying here, too. Because, you know, frankly, I think Michael represents uh, a fair amount of what of what guys are thinking out there. I mean, the guys are out in the bars and they're out trying to, you know, trying to make dates and, and pick up women. Wouldn't you agree that yeah. you represent a yeah. large uh, part of the male population? Yeah, I, I disagree with uh, the way this guy went about it. He attacked her, but, um, you know, trying to persuade someone, you know, verbally, or that's, there's nothing wrong with trying. You know? All right, we're going to hear our audience react to, to, to that when we come back. Also, we're going to be joined by attorney Ben Gullo, who successfully defended one of the young men accused of sexual assault in the highly publicized St. John's University case here in New York City. We'll discuss sexual assault and drinking, and when is date rape actually alcohol remorse? When we come right back. <laughs> We're back discussing a painful topic that until recently had been often swept under the rug, date rape. D Delisha Meehan claims that her life changed forever one night in 1988 when she woke from a sound sleep to find herself being raped by the man she had dated earlier that evening. And Michael Platarotti, who doesn't feel that all date rape cases are really rape at all. Also joining us now is Ben Gullo. He's a lawyer who successfully defended 22-year-old Matthew Grandinetti, whose life, as described in a New York Times article, was that of a young, white, athletic, American dream-type boy. Well, that image changed forever by numerous sexual assault charges in the recent infamous case involving three all-American boys from St. John's University. And please welcome him. Uh, ben, Matthew was, Matthew was acquitted on charges of sodomy in the first degree and sexual misconduct, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, First of all, do you think that the verdict, and I know that you're, you're happy with the verdict, obviously, you defended him, but do you think that perhaps the verdict might send a message to women that if they, if they want to report a rape, that they possibly will not be believed? No, I don't think so at all. Uh, I think the St. John's case was rather unique for several reasons. One, it involved a uh, Catholic institution of higher learning. Uh, secondly, uh, the complainant uh, was a minority person. And third, the students involved were white, so-called all-American boys. So I think in the context of the case and when the media got a hold of the case, it just got out of hand. I think as far as uh, a young woman today or any woman, uh, it's easier her, for her to uh, bring a complaint against a, a defendant. Uh, the laws are easier and I think we have a more open atmosphere of a woman not feeling as inhibited as they used to in the past uh, with charges like this. Now, the, uh, all of the people involved in, in your case, they, they were drinking, correct? They were at a, uh, some sort of fraternity house or something? No. Uh, the testimony in the case was that the complainant was drinking. Uh, there was no testimony that uh, the defendants themselves had been drinking. Okay, now because the complainant was, was drinking. Do you think that this uh, is the reason why uh, uh, your, your client was, was acquitted? Uh, you know, I think a common viewpoint is, and, and you tell me if this is the case, and Delisha, I want to hear what your uh, view is on this as well, that the woman, when she's drinking, when an alleged incident like this happens, is somehow more responsible for her behavior than the guy. The law uh, as far as drinking is concerned, is that if a person is physically helpless, if they're under the influence of alcohol or a drug, well, they're unable to consent. The complainant maintained in the St. John's case that she was under the influence of alcohol. And even though some of the defendants said they had sex consensually with the complainant, uh, under those circumstances, um, she made out an allegation which was sufficient to have them arrested, indicted, and brought to trial. Alicia, in your case, didn't you think that uh, the judge didn't believe you because you, you were drinking? And in fact, didn't the guy say... That was his whole... He said that... That you had had how many drinks? 13 or 15 double gin and tonics, and the chief of police told me I'd be dead if I drank that many. Okay, your question. Well, I just want to say, I guess, that um, in my freshman year in college, I got threatened. Um, a young man came into my room 
sat on the edge of my bed and spent approximately two hours threatening to rape me. Now, he was drunk, and I was told by numerous people, including a student represent representative of my college, that it would never happen if he wasn't drunk, and I should just shut up and not deal with it because it wasn't his fault because he was drunk, and that's garbage. Because, you no, know, he chose to drink, and his actions, even if they were impaired by alcohol, are his actions, and he was responsible. And you cannot claim that someone is not responsible just because they chose to drink. Well, under the law, you're right. Uh, if somebody voluntarily drinks, that's not an excuse for their conduct. So the information that you received was incorrect. But uh, again, isn't it true that when a woman, in a case like this, when a woman is drinking, that the implication is, well, she was asking for it? No, the implication is, is that her credibility is an issue, just as if um, I accuse you of assaulting me. Uh, and uh, at the time that uh, I make this accusation that uh, you've been drinking. Uh, it's, it's a common thing to test whether or not a witness or a complainant is telling the truth. Okay, yes, your question. Oh, I didn't have a question. I had a statement. And this was in reference to what Michael, I believe his name is, stated. Michael stated that it's okay for a guy to continue to attempt to persuade a woman to submit to him. Um, what I say is, yes, to a certain extent that's correct. Um, to a certain extent that a lot of us, w as women, might want a guy to show us that he's um, interested to a certain degree. But what we all fail to believe or understand is that no means no. It doesn't matter what she's thinking in her head and what signals a guy thinks he may be receiving. Because no is the articulated statement. And that is all you have to go by, unless, of course, you are a mind reader and you think that you can um, succeed in a court of law after mind reading. I think that you shouldn't, you shouldn't go by that, um, that instinct, because we don't go by instincts anymore. We go by the spoken word. So you said it's okay to pursue to a certain extent. So if you do pursue it and you do not pass that that line, that borderline, and she consents and, and has sexual intercourse with you, when she wakes up in the morning and says, I, I regret this, you rape me. That's not rape. That's not what we're talking about. Well, no, I can't hear you. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is a woman who says no. Now, a woman, just like anybody else, can change her mind. And if she changes her mind because of your persuasions, okay, that's fine. But that's not what rape is. Rape is a man taking a woman without her consent. A woman, this woman here didn't say yes. She said no. And no means no. Okay, your question. Um, yes, I'm beginning college in the fall, and I was wondering if the lady in the middle has any, um, any clue, anything that she's found that can clue someone in to knowing she might be at risk with someone that she's met. I never put myself alone with anybody. If anything feels wrong, I'd get out, and I carry mace. I also carry a gun. But that's the scary part about this acquaintance rape or date rape, is you just don't know if, if you, you kind of get to know a guy out on a date, and you kind of trust him, and then bingo. You know, what do you do in a case like that? That's, I don't know. When you know him, it's hard, because you don't expect it from somebody you know. Yeah. All right, and just one last thing I want to say about, about Michael coming on here. Our producers went out this weekend looking for somebody to come on and, and represent this, this male point of view. And I'll tell you, a lot of guys said what Michael said, but wouldn't show their face on camera. And uh, so I just wanted to make that clear. And, uh, and thank you all for coming on and sharing your stories, Ben and Delicia and uh, Michael. Thank you very much. Give them a hand, folks. You know, date rape is... Um, it's the secret shame of many college campuses as well as big cities, small towns all across America. And we hope that we've shed just a little bit more light on this issue as a small step, hopefully, in preventing this tragedy. We'll be right back. Petticoat Junction. It was one of America's favorite sitcoms of the 60s. Today, the three beautiful sisters of the Shady Rest Hotel are reunited. Please help me welcome Billy Joe, Bobby Joe, and Betty Joe, Lori Saunders, 
Meredith McRae, and Linda Henning. It's run by Kate Crum and be her <laughs> guest at the junction. And that's Uncle Joe, he's moving got so I love well, that. Sound Hi. familiar to you guys? <laughs> oh, yes. No, I'm Billy Joe. Meredith is Billy Joe, and Lori is Bobby Joe. Right. We right. Always have. And Betty Joe. I'm Betty right. Joe. That's right. 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 Now, you guys have spent the last 24 hours together. Yes. <laughs> Has it churned up all sorts of fond <laughs> memories? A ball. We've been having the best time shopping yeah. today. Were <laughs> you? <laughs> Did people run up to you and say, oh, my God, you guys are really sisters in real life? Yeah, yeah well, they the do. On the plane, the stewardess gave us a bottle of champagne and yeah. said, go have fun tonight, girl. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What What are some of the most wonderful memories you have of Petticoat Junction? Oh, oh who should go first? Oh. I would say, uh, with me, and I think with all of us, it's the people. We had one of the friendliest sets in the world. Everybody loved working on our show because we were all s such good friends. Yeah. And we were all, we all had a good time. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of ego going no. on. We had wonderful character actors on the show. Some just great people. And the crew, I still run into crew today on other sets and it's like old home week. Is it? Right. We yeah. loved each other. There was no, uh, none of the problems that you have on some shows like Designing Women, as we all know, has had a lot of problems. Right. We three really got along. We, we socialized off the set. We had a nightclub act at one point. <laughs> we had so much fun. We did all sorts of fun things together. We played tricks on each other. It was fun. Like what kind of tricks? Lori? Well, Lori, yeah, well, tell one. <laughs> but Meredith was always cleaning her room. <laughs> and, I, and it just kind of like got to me after a while that somebody could be that neat. So I, you a slob in real life, no, are you? I'm not a slob, I, but, you know, I'm not that neat. And uh, anyway, so I took dirt and I just sprinkled it all around her room to give her something to clean. I mean, you know. Oh, I think that's kind of nice. Did you get crazy when she did it? Lots of dirt with rocks and things. <laughs> and we, had, we had a lot of fun. And uh, at one point, you know, we got a little bored, we must confess, Linda, because when you have such a large cast, you do sit around a lot and you wait for your line. Yeah. Look, Mom, here comes the train, yeah. you know? And so we would do all sorts of things. And um, one of the things that we did, I remember, well, we ended up going on tour, which was a lot of fun. Oh, no, I, I know what I was going to say first, is that around the set, we decided that we'd take up rug hooking. So we used to sit around and we'd call ourselves the three hookers because we were like, you know, <laughs> hooking all these rugs. And Lori and Linda finished their rugs and went on to the second one. And to this day, mine is not finished. So yeah, but not. mine was you so, kept it, though. mine got so big that I was like hauling it to the front. <laughs> I mean, it was like, move the chair. Okay, would you move my rug, too? I mean, you know, this was a series that lasted for seven years mm -hmm. and it was really hugely successful. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose it was so successful? Was it the purity, the innocence of it? Mm. I think, I know with my association with it, kids would write me and they would say, you know, every day I come home from school and we play Petticoat Junction and I'm you. Yeah. They could relate to us. We were just people, you know, yeah. and we we, re, you know, relate, they could relate to us all across the country, all these people. And I think it was just basic and simple. We al I always say that we were sort of the first Charlie's, Charlie's Angels. Angels. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, three you know? so sure. The writing was excellent. And Linda's father, Paul Henning, created and wrote the show. And I mean, it was fabulous. I mean, it was things that people could relate to. And I think that people love middle American values, which is certainly what You think what the show, show would has. stand up today? I think it would because you know why? Sure. I think that people like a wide variety of shows today, as we've seen. They like to watch everything. There's not one genre that's in today. People yeah. like action. They like talk shows. They like all kinds. I think our show would be a big smash. In fact, we're working on a reunion show. Are yeah. you? We are. Why don't? Why would you all come back and play yourself? Yeah, <laughs> hey guys, yeah. More, it would be a little bit more sophisticated than what it was because obviously we're not the same people either. Right. I mean, right. I mean you know. yeah. oh Lori, now come on. I don't know. You could be in those little With dresses little again yeah. and the bow. <laughs> So, did you guys get a lot of marriage proposals when you did the show? Well, I don't oh, know if you could call it well, marriage. <laughs> you got married, Lori. That I know. I never got a marriage proposal, but I remember one time I went on some talk show and I made the mistake of saying that my fantasy was to be in a football player's locker room. Uh -oh. and some guy said, well, I'm a football player and here's what we look like and sent me a picture from the waist down. <laughs> Nude? Oh, yeah. Really? <laughs> Quite Did you call him? Quite <laughs> <laughs> no, but she kept his picture. She kept the picture. She still got it with I the hooked still, rug. I still have yeah. it today. Well, I got a marriage proposal from, a, I think, a kid, but he would send me two-page telegrams. 
and he lived on the East Coast someplace, and he would send me telegrams saying, I'm so glad that you accepted my proposal, <laughs> you know. And, you know, and when he found out I, was, I got married, he would then send me two-page telegrams saying, well, I'm really happy you got married, but I would like to babysit your child. Oh, you know? my oh, God. Wow. God. This man oh, has no life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, you, you, it's been 21 years you went off the air. What have you guys been up to? Tell us what you've been doing. Lori, what are you doing? Tell us. Well, I have a lo um, foundation called for the Love of Life Foundation, and that's just to put information out there, raise the consciousness levels, you know, people's information. And one of the things we worked on is an anti-cigarette thing, but what I'd like to get involved more in is uh, beauty without cruelty. You know, it's so important. Using to, animals to yeah, test beauty products. And, I mean, yeah. it's not necessary. It's not yeah. taking anything away from people, you know. And so you're, you're married? You have two children? I have been married now for mm, years. <laughs> See, I was married on petticoats, right. you know, so. And it's lasted? And to, oh, yeah. Congratulations. 31 years in January. And they said it never would last. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Meredith, what about you? Well, I've sort of switched my careers a bit, Linda. Um, I am a talk show host primarily yes. now, an interviewer and a producer. I'm, I'm proud to say I won an Emmy for my interviewing, which was fun. I had a show in Los Angeles that I hosted for many years. And in fact, I have a show that I created called Born Famous, which airs here on Lifetime. Yes, it does. Right. Where I interview people from famous families. And once in a while, I do some acting, but primarily, I really enjoy interviewing people. And, and I love producing. One of the things, as you know, is you, know, you have more control. As an actress, you're sitting around waiting mm -hmm. for your next job. Mm -hmm. And I also do a lot of work uh, about families and alcohol, because I am the child of an alcoholic. And I do a lot of speeches around the country talking about what it's like to be the adult child. What about your alcohol. romantic life? Oh, my Can romantic get life. You asked me at the perfect yeah. time. I am very much in love with someone, and I think one of these days we will be having an announcement to make. Good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Linda, what about you? Well, I'm still doing? acting. I belong to a wonderful radio group. Uh, we do plays on the radio. Oh, in fact, yeah. we just won two gold medals and a silver medal in an international contest. We do Shakespeare, Shaw, uh, Oscar Wilde. And it's fabulous. And I do a lot of television and theater, and I have become a docent at the L.A. Zoo. They're the people who take you on tours yeah. and teach you, and I love it. So I when I come to L.A., I can look you absolutely. up? Absolutely. You'll take me on a tour? Absolutely. And I'm learning sign language, which oh, is yeah. something I've always yeah. wanted to do, too. Well, it's fun to see them, isn't it? Don't they look good? Thank you. Thanks for joining us. It really was fun. You all are great. Thank you. All right. Something's cooking in the kitchen. Uh, what's going on over there, Jerry? Something. Uh, I smell yeah, it. Yeah, you bet something's cooking here. Linda, we're going to bring you back to the days of real old-fashioned cooking with mouth-watering recipes from real Amish kitchens. We'll be right back. And the values of the Amish people represent a past that is distinctly American. Their culture often strikes us as a little foreign and certainly mysterious. Recently, through her own show called Amish Cooking from Quilt Country, our next guest has been bringing a little piece of Amish life closer to home. Take a look. Hi there. Welcome to Amish Cooking from Quilt Country. Ordinarily, when we think of Amish food, we might be inclined to think of plain food, like mashed potatoes and gravy, chicken and noodles, pies, all of those very good homey foods. Please help us welcome TV chef Marcia Adams. Hi, Marcia. Hi, Marcia. Hi, Marcia. Welcome. Come to be with you. All right. Nice to have you. All right. What are we going to make today? Well, this is a uh, rather typical Amish recipe. It's called six weeks bran muffins. Now, you can, what does the six week mean? In there? Well, it means it keeps for six weeks in the refrigerator. So you the whip batter. up a, a batter yes, of it, yes. and then you can pour like a muffin or two every morning. Yes, All if right. you like. It's like jail. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll, I'll look like a muffin after <laughs> eating it for six weeks, right? Let's tell you what the ingredients are for making the six week muffins five cups of flour, five teaspoons baking soda, two teaspoons salt, two teaspoons allspice. One 15 ounce box of bran flakes with raisins, three cups of sugar, four eggs, one cup vegetable oil, one quart buttermilk, two teaspoons vanilla. Okay, okay how do we All start? Right, Marcia, okay, do we do? Uh, let's begin with the dry ingredients, and you start there. This big okay. bowl? What do I no, do? I'm going to change places with you. Okay, okay. right here. You. Uh, you do these dry ingredients here. Just throw the flour? Yes. 
And, and you start on the wet. Should uh, I do this that. first? Yes, put these up, please. Should I put okay. all of this in here, Marsha? Yes, that's five teaspoons of soda. That's your left Now, okay. Marsha. All of this salt? Two teaspoons of salt. Okay. More tell, and more. Tell everybody about the Amish people, some of their traditions ah. and values. Well, they haven't changed since the 17th century, and that's what makes them unique. And it's really a commonwealth society. It is a subculture, and it's not dying out. And uh, uh, the average Amish family has seven children. Seven. Seven now, children. You're from Indiana Amish yes. country, right? Which is different than the Pennsylvania Dutch Amish. Yes. Right? Tell us how they're different. All right. Um, oh, am I not? I'm yes, oh, that goes in there. Thank right. you. All of this in All here. this. All okay. that in there. Oh, this is wonderful. I never had this kind of help. I know. I oh, but you you just chat away. Now, you want to talk about how they're different. Um, the Amish that are in Pennsylvania are mainly Germanic. Mm. The ones that live in Indiana came in a later migration in 1848, and they're Swiss and Alsatian. Mm. So their recipes are Swiss and Alsatian rather than German, and they're a little bit lighter. And now we're ready to combine. Now, okay. this is not exactly what we would today call healthy because it has eggs and so much sugar. Sugar. Too, right? and uh, all of that. Let me address that. The average Amish farmer uses up like four. This goes in there. In here. Right. Sorry. Ooh, this is wonderful. Um, you can hire us to be your assistants on I your know, show. I know. I'm seeing you're, you're very quick and very good. Um, has like uses up 4,000 calories, and then I'm going to move a on day. This side. Yes. And the average housewife uses up like. 2,800 to 3,000. Because they're doing all the farm work right. and all that hard no work. No electricity. Yeah. They use horse and buggies. They have not changed since the 1700s. They decided to live apart, and they live totally by what they consider biblical injunctions. And that's another reason we have the faceless dolls, because they think that they should have no graven images right. before now them. Now, you have photographs in your book of yes. the Amish. Yes. I didn't know they allowed themselves to be photographed. They don't like it, do they, Marcia? Well, I, there are, are mingled feelings among the Amish about that. Those who are more sophisticated and have had more interplay Actually, it's easier if you use a spoon. Hand oh. this poor woman a spoon. How about there? if I help you there, Lane? That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. There's you no bowls big enough. Right, you know, right. Arm is starting to well, break. You know, with these big families, the average Amish woman will feed 15 people three times a day. So she yeah. really needs a lot of uh, big recipes like this. But I'm, now I can start dabbing in. Okay. I must tell you that um, this food that the Amish cook is fantastic for entertaining for these reasons. You can make it up in large amounts, as you can see. Right. Yeah. It's quite so different. These are what you call 18th and 19th century. What are they laughing at? I'm doing I have no right. idea. I think so, too. They have no idea how difficult this is. <laughs> That's right. You're getting it Good. kind of over everything. Is that what I'm doing right? Yeah. Oh, there. Well. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. I think Mae West has a great quote. Cook with abandon or don't cook at all. <laughs> That's right. right. I cook Stop with abandon. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now, we throw this in the oven for how long? Uh, 375 you know, to 20 minutes. A little dab uh, for each one, right? Uh, yeah, the, enough is enough it's already. Enough. Okay. Right. So we'll like just pretend this is in the oven. Yes, pretend that's in the oven. We're so and good at that. And we're going over here. Over here. Look what we oh, have done, Great. Right. Let's talk Ooh. more about the nice things that Marcia, are here. Please please we have a taste right. tester here. Are you Hello? all set? Good. Turn Look at how they turn out, oh. folks. Look at how Norma. nice. Norma's going to help us try this. Now, do you have a muffin? Please, please Norma, help yourself. Help yourself, Norma. Now, mind you, this batter keeps for six weeks in the refrigerator. And you date it. easy to make. I know. And you can uh, have a freeze it? Oh, no, 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 no. You don't no. have to freeze it. No, no. You just won't spoil or anything. Oh, no, not at all. The buttermilk has this preservative. Oh, my. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. These are really good. Oh, mm -hmm. look, they're dying. They're drooling. <laughs> Bring them up. Bring them up. <laughs> what else did you make here, This Marcia? is a very old fashioned coleslaw. It has peanuts in it. Really? But this is my favorite recipe in the cookbook. And this is called a brown sugar pie mm. or our poor man's pie. And you mix it up right in the pie shell with your feet. Look oh, look at Norma. Jeez. Look at Norma. She's not holding that. Right. How are you doing here? You know what, though? It's kind of a mess, though, to Let cut, isn't it? May I do it? Oh, please do it, because I'm making I know. a mess. Now, Marsha's show, it. everybody, can be seen on PBS stations across the country. And if you would like to try this recipe at home, or any of these, you can send us a self-addressed stamped envelope to... Amish Recipes, Care of Attitude, 34-12, 36th Street, Astoria, New York, 11106. Now, this pie is made with brown sugar and cream and mm. butter, all mm. those good things. All right. And I do think we ought to consider the word moderation here, you see? Yes. That's right. And that's how we keep our figures down. Right, right. So cut me a big piece. That's please. right. A very big piece. We'll be right back, folks. Right Thanks, Marcia. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, right. Thank you Norma. You're having a great time, aren't you? You good?
we'd love to have you be part of Attitudes. If you would like tickets, please send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Attitudes Tickets, 34-12, 36th Street, Astoria, New York, 11106. Or give us a call, area code 718-706-3575. We'll see you there. Are you hungry? Yeah, hey, we're hungry. Yeah. We gotta go. Bye, bye, folks. Bye, everybody. Let Thanks them eat cake. There you go, you guys. Uh, dig in. Go ahead. All right. Now stay tuned for Amy Madigan and Bo Bridges in Love Child on the Lifetime Afternoon Movie. Next.